as regulators, how are you navigating this breakneck speed of technological development that we've been hearing about, particularly in the fintech landscape? Um, how are you supporting innovation as well as regulating it? Sure, thanks. Um, first of all, just to say how happy I am to be here uh, with um, you know, MES. We've got very close relationships with our uh, counterparts, both the Bank of Japan as well as um, uh, the GFSA. Uh, we work very closely with the Japanese financial institutions and I think the Japanese fintechs have also been big supporters of our fintech festival. So, you know, very, very happy to be here. Now, just uh, addressing your question directly, I think a useful starting point is to ask ourselves what do we hope to achieve with fintech? So over the years, you know, MAS has come out and say that, you know, uh, with fintech, we hope to achieve four big uh, objectives. Number one, uh, improve efficiencies. Number two, manage risks better. Number three, create new growth opportunities. And lastly, improve people's lives, mm. right? So improve people's lives is not something you typically hear uh, coming out of uh, central bank communications. But, you know, when we think about fintech, and why we want to harness technology, uh, we think about what we want to use the technology for and improving people's lives actually is at the core of it. The event of Web3, right, was a very, very significant development, right? If we were to have this conversation about balancing regulation and, you know, uh, innovation 10 years ago, I think the tone would be different. Today, the discussion is important because uh, advent of Web3 and more recently, other you know, breakthroughs, including AI and Gen AI, and including quantum. And with the event of Web3 and all these other significant developments, significant innovation was happening outside the regulated financial system. And so it's very important for central banks and regulatory authorities to have an informed view of what's happening and then decide for themselves what role they want to play. From a regulatory perspective, it's important to also keep up right, with the pace of innovation right, and not fall behind the curve. Mm. More importantly, there's also the scope for central banks and regulators to work collaboratively and proactively with the innovators, the new fintech players, to shape the future of the financial ecosystem. This is important to do so because, you know, as and when industry shifts happen, things can happen in a sound and sustainable way. So what have we done in practice on the MAS side? I would highlight three aspects. The first is, you know, from an overall signaling perspective, you know, MAS has consistently uh, put across that we remain open to innovation, come and work with us. So I think this overall signaling has been very, very useful mm -hmm. because the regulatory attitudes towards innovation differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I think it's important to convey a steady message. Mm -hmm. We are open to innovation. Come and work with us. Second, not just signaling, but do things with the industry. So, you know, we have done many pilots. Uh, for those of you who have been following, you know, what we have been doing uh, and we have uh, announced over uh, different uh, years of uh, fintech festivals. We have done many pilots jointly experimenting with technology as well as uh, introducing regulatory sandboxes. This has helped us build muscles. This has also helped us understand the nature of the beast, right? Uh, but also identify growth opportunities. And then the third aspect is quite interesting. The third aspect is internal culture. So I'm not exaggerating when I say innovators and regulators are different breeds of animal. They are, they are very different breeds. Mm -hmm. Today, you know, my chief innovation officer who just walked in, Sotendu, <laughs> I call him a dreamer. And if I put him to get next to our chief regulator, I can safely say it's a little bit awkward, right? <laughs> So, 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 but within organizations and within, you know, central banks and regulators, uh, we have to find a way, right, that within our organizations, we foster healthy tensions, foster healthy tensions, and find ways of internalizing these tensions and optimizing outcomes. The culture aspect is uh, very important. And this is important because when things become difficult, when risk events happen, right, and we have seen, you know, uh, many, some of them materializing in the last one or two years, all of us chip in. And, you know, uh, can we contribute to discussions in terms of how best 
to calibrate an ex appropriate response to the risk issue that we are trying to manage. And this is based on an informed view mm -hmm. as opposed to we don't know what's happening and therefore on a blanket basis, right, yeah. Um, yeah. we take action. Right? That's, that's my mm -hmm. you know, uh, answer to balancing regulation and innovation. Thank you. Excellent. Yanase-san, the Japanese perspective, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, of, uh, first of all, let me also say I'm, I'm really you know, honoured to be here and having you know, this very uh, important and interesting discussion with my uh, uh, fellow supervisor uh, from Mars. And as he said, yeah, we, JFSA and BOJ and Mars has, been, has a long record of collaboration and partnership. And uh, we, value, you know, we value this you know, very much. Coming to your question, mm. how do we navigate? Mm. It's not easy, right? Yes. And, and actually, you know, this question is not just for us. I mean, not just for, you know, us, you know, regulators and mm. supervisors. I think, you know, this is a question posed to all of us, yeah. including the industry and including ourselves and including even media, right? We now have new technologies and we don't know, you know, how these new technologies would change the world, not just, you know, finance, but the world. How can we sort of you know navigate? Or, you know, how can we sort of manage or control this technology? It's you know uh, it's not just it's a challenge not just for us regulators but for also for everybody. When I think about this sort of personally, you know, I I said you know I'm traditionally a bank supervisor, and uh, being a bank supervisor, you know, I always sort of think about sort of history of banking supervision and regulation. Banking regulation sort of comes from the uh, invention of fractional banking. And uh, human beings have experienced sort of many sort of disasters, like, you know, Great Depression, because of fractional banking. So, you know, all the regulation and the supervision were sort of invented to sort of respond to this uh, fractional banking, which is a very sort of important and, important and useful so-called technology, but can be very risky, mm -hmm. as we have seen. So now we have blockchain. We have generative AI, and we may be having, you know, uh, quantitative, quantitative computing. And this may also be as useful as fractional banking and as a sort of traditional financial technologies, mm -hmm. but can be also as risky as they were. Yeah. And unfortunately for, you know, for the past sort of past history of finance, you know, we have seen many sort of, you know, tragedies. And this time... Maybe there is a room for us to avoid sort of all these sort of tragedy, tragedies, just sort of you know, collect the fruits of the, these new technologies. Mm. And the question is, how are we going to do that? That's right. Yes. Well, you know, I don't have an answer, mm -hmm. but, you know, we should be wiser than, you know, we used to be like 100 or 50, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we need to find, you know, we need to find ways to, you know, deal with that. Absolutely. So... Uh, what we do here, what we do here, I mean, we are sort of you know, establishing sort of regulatory framework for, you know, different kind of sort of financial uh, fintech companies. But so, so the basis of sort of this regression is our belief that, uh, that we need sort of, you know, healthy corporate structure and corporate control and corporate governance for fintech companies. We are asking banks to have good governance, good internal control. And probably also need the same thing for the fintech companies. And uh, for that, you know, our, we, you know, our regulation states, you know, that they need to, you know, be have a good governance system and good internal control system. And we also have a sort of supervisory system to make sure that these companies have these things. Uh, Sichun just mentioned, you know, we saw a few sort of, you know, few incidents uh, in, uh, you know, large sort of fintech companies don't fail. But when you look at that particular episode. Is that failure coming from new technology? Mm. The answer is no, right? Yeah. The answer is, oh, bad management, bad governance, lack of internal control, lack of three lines of defense. Mm. I think Which makes one, your, yes, both of I your think the one key, even more yeah, crucial. Right. Yes. One key of sort of, you know, uh, balance, you know, striking balance between innovation and risk is you look at the organization, you look at the structure, who are using sort of these, you know, making innovations and using technologies mm -hmm. and ask them that they should have good governance, good control. And of course, you know, we are not, you know, we, we don't know, you know, for example, how we apply this sort of principle to DeFi. But I think, you know, this is, you know, what we are trying to do because even, you know, they are new technologies, they are used by humans and organization established by human beings. Yes. Then probably we should go back to human beings and ask them, they are using sort of technologies in a proper manner. 
That's right. Thank you, Yanasi. So it's really interesting. Uh, I mean, you both acknowledge it is a very difficult job uh, navigating that whole, um, you know, tug of war between innovation and regulation. But uh, as you both say, it's about staying informed, staying on top of it, and ultimately. Uh, most of the things that fail because of a lack of corporate governance, which then exemplifies and amplifies both of your roles as regulators, creating the structure so that people uh, obey the rules and do the right thing as people. That's what we are. Now, moving beyond people, though, let's face it. I mean, it is uh, an era, uh, certainly for the last day or so. It's a word I cannot seem to get away from, and it is AI, because everyone here has talked about it, the, the investors, the regulators, the innovators, and it's come up a lot at this JFF forum. So what are your views on uh, the role that policymakers like yourselves, regulators like yourselves, can play in supporting and innovating um, investment in AI? Thanks. Uh, indeed, I think that's, uh, that's the burning issue now. I think at the outset, it's really to recognize both the opportunities as well as risks. So as you know, Ravi mentioned yesterday, different types of AI technologies, deep learning, machine learning, large language models, Gen AI, huge potential uh, to reap productivity gains, deep potential uh, to, for transformational uh, applications uh, in uh, portfolio optimization, risk management, uh, as well as a AML and fraud detection. But we need to recognize risks, right? Risks of bias, data privacy issues, and frauds and scams. I was uh, quite taken by a recent, you know, um, scam that happened involving, uh, you know, this uh, CFO, mm -hmm. right, who was uh, called into a virtual meeting. Uh, and, you know, virtual meeting with uh, the CEO plus a few management members. Mm -hmm. uh, and during the meeting, he was instructed to make a payment to close off an urgent transaction. Uh, and it so turns out that other than himself, everyone in that virtual call was a deep fake. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> right? So I think, you know, um, as I said, recognize opportunities, but be very, very, very conscious mm -hmm. about the risk. Mm -hmm. And these risks are not just for regulators to worry about. Right? It is actually for the users mm -hmm. to own and manage. Now, at MESS end, we have uh, developed our feed principles, which is uh, fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. These principles were developed some years back. Last year, we launched uh, the Veritas Toolkit, which is actually an actual software right, for financial institutions to measure their own compliance with the feed principles. And our own regulators are also looking at this uh, toolkit. Currently, we are updating these principles right, uh, to take into consideration Gen AI developments. But the interesting opportunity here is data, mm. right? Because data is at the heart of AI. One view that we can take is, you know, whatever uh, AI applications you develop within your own organizations, we leave that to you. But are there opportunities to actually reap industry-wide, right, uh, benefits? Mm -hmm. Uh, that can arise from FIs sharing data with each other. Not easy to do because there are always mm -hmm. commercial considerations. Uh, FIs view these data as uh, proprietary. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there an opportunity to develop data sharing protocols? Mm. Right. Uh, first, between FI to FI. Second, between FIs mm -hmm. and the MAS mm -hmm. as a regulator. Third, between FIs and government agencies. I think this is because government agencies uh, are valuable data sources of data as well. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly important when we think about sustainability mm -hmm. uh, and uh, golden sources of truth, right? So I think, you know, uh, quite apart from the fact that uh, AI technology, right, is advancing at rapid pace, but tackle the foundational layer, which is, you know, think of opportunities to develop data sharing frameworks and protocols that make people more comfortable right, to share data mm -hmm. outside of their organizations in a way that can uh, generate much bigger applications uh, uh, compared to if you try to solve it within your own organization. And that's, I think, the uh, opportunity that we are working mm -hmm. on. Yeah, good to hear. Uh, well, uh, you just mentioned about data. 
And I think you know the issue of data is pretty important. And uh, until you know we have this AI or gen generative AI, I'm sure you know all the financial institution has a have a very huge sort of data which they are not utilizing, right? And uh, I think they uh, like machine, uh, you know, AI technologies like machine learning and uh, generative AI gives a sort of tools for you know financial institution to utilize, you know, to use data which are, which used to be very un unutilized. But this is not just about technology. I think you know important thing is that uh, you know those people in the financial institution needs to change you know how they are thinking about data. Mm. I mean probably you know I mean before that you know they know they knew they have data, but you know and but they was uh, they were not you know feeling like you know they can use those data. Now you know using you know applying like machine learning or you know generative AI. There is a you know huge potential that they can utilize those data. So that's you know something something you know the people in the financial industry should think about. And also, I'm I'm not actually I wasn't I wasn't there, but you know maybe you know Minister Kono spoke about it last night. But uh, you know Japan is also you know uh, creating a system to sort of link data, uh, link you know people's sort of data. Of course, you know there are you know certain sort of concern about it. But you know once uh, we are able to sort of connect sort of data of you know people. And with you know with the with the appropriate protection of their privacy, you know that would uh, that would give a you know huge sort of productive productivity gain for you know financial institutions, but probably not just for financial institutions. And uh, coming back to sort of you know more general theme of generative AI, uh, I was in another session uh, you know uh, this morning, and we were discussing about you know when we are starting to use generative AI, probably we need to think about you know probably we also need to change ourselves. I mean, we need we need to change how we think mm -hmm. because, like you know, until now we are basically you know we were in big organizations, so we were sort of accustomed to use people, right? And 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 until now, you know, we were tend to use people, right? But now maybe we need to, you know, get accustomed to, sort of get used to, sort of using sort of generative AI instead of people. Then uh, this is, you know, often a question you know, I ask myself and I discuss with other people. You know, when you are getting a sort of report from your peer, and if it is prepared by a human being, uh, how do you deal with that? And if it is produced by generative AI? How do you deal with that? Mm. This is an interesting question. And uh, for example, you know, we are getting sort of, you know, we are, we are getting report, you know, our people sort of, you know, reports to me mm -hmm. and we see, you know, their draft and, you know, we check their draft. And, you know, we get used to, you know, how to check this draft if it is prepared originally by people, by, by a human being, yeah. right? But probably we are not yet get used to sort of checking so, you know, product, you know, the document produced by a generative AI, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we know how people would make mistakes. What kind of sort of mistakes we need to sort of look for. And probably, you know, we, we, we need to sort of change ourselves so that, you know, we can sort of, we can work more sort of smoothly and more appropriately with sort of using mm -hmm. generative AI. And of course, you know, I don't know how to do that yet. And probably, you know, I mean, that's something, you know, we need to look for. And we need to work with sort of many sort of different people to find it. Of course, you know, until then, you know, probably for the financial sector, we should do the sort of small start. I mean, you know, there are still, you know, many risks, like, you know, you said, you know, data, house nations, sort of privacy, so many sort of risks are there. So at least, you know, for Japanese, uh, Japanese financial uh, institutions, they are still, you know, very careful. They are using sort of generative AI only for interna internal purpose. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, that's a, you know, uh, be, uh, that's a good start, uh, good point to start. Probably, you know, we should start small, yeah. but, you know, we shouldn't sort of hesitate starting. Right. Yeah. So and as long you know, so more sort of we can accumulate sort of our experience with using generative AI under sort of controlled environment under sort of you know, small sort of you know, with a small start, yeah. then probably you know we have more lessons so that we can sort of expand you know how we use how we use sort of our gener generative AI technology to a more sort of wider sort of wider business wider you know, customers and. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, abs what you say is absolutely true. I think there's mass adoption now, or a slow adoption, but it will be a mass adoption of using generative AI. We've really started seeing our, our kids use it at school, let's face it. Uh, and ultimately, it's going to be used in all our jobs 
at some stage in the future if it's not already being done to some extent. Now, I've realised the time has really gotten away from me. We've only got 15 minutes left and I've still got so many questions for both of you. Um, but I think, crucially, I'd also like to get questions from the audience because, again, you know, there's this sort of divide. You know, we've got all these fintech entrepreneurs out there who want to scale, who want innovation, and then they see both of you up here as regulators, as, as, as the suits who are kind of the the stuffy ones, right? Who are kind of standing in the way of the ability for them to grow and scale up. What would you say to them to reassure them that you basically have their backs, that you're, you're kind of ensuring that they will be able to scale, they will be able to grow, they will be able to go out and innovate, and how are you helping them do so? And I know I, I kind of asked this question at the start, but I'm just really interested in this, in this ability for both of you, both sides to speak. Uh, yes, uh, let me start with that. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much for posing that, you know, uh, bringing up that question, because this is a very important question, and which... I think you know, everybody is, you know, keep, you know, keep speaking. I think, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Men yesterday, the important things probably, you know, um, and actually, you know, you just mentioned, you, you just mentioned but uh, we have the same goal, right? I mean, people, sort of innovators and regulators, in my view, ha has a common goal, is, you know, making people happy and making the world a happier place, right? So it's just a sort of a difference of, you know, approaches, we are having, and you know, maybe we have you know different stakeholders, but you know we should sort of we should understand, you know, we should sort of aware that we have the common goal. So that's why you know we are always sort of asking for more sort of interaction, more communication, mm, right? So, so we may be sort of in sometimes sort of standing, you know, uh, but we also have reasons for that, mm. and uh, we, I mean, both both sides sort of needs to understand, you know. What are reasons behind why they are doing that? Mm -hmm. And that would sort of, you know, that would sort of strengthen the common understanding of what we should do with, uh, you know, with, uh, with the industry, with the service, and making it a sort of better thing for, you know, everybody. That's my sort of, that's my plea for, you know, more yeah. communication yeah. and induction. Yeah. Excellent. And I guess that is kind of in line with what you said earlier, this whole notion of communicating, ensuring that, uh, you know, you're listening to, to the other side and you're trying to take into account their perspective so that you can able, enable the right kind of regulations to be able to serve them and their customers. Now, also at the start, I was really, I love, it was great to hear that both of you are collaborating as regulators together. But what kind of collaboration do you envisage with your colleagues globally, for instance, on something that's really, well, let's face it, it's at the top of our minds, crypto, and, and, and what happened with FTX and, and Binance and a number of those other companies. Um, Obviously, Yanase san you spoke yesterday about how uh, Japan ensured that many investors here were, uh, were protected from any kind of fallout from that, but that wasn't the case globally. So how do you all manage to work collaboratively so that there is, uh, I guess the term is, uh, a regulatory clarity on those sort of uh, issues? How can you all make sure that you're all on the same page when it comes to telling investors and companies, this is what they need to know. Thanks. Um, if I can just say a few words about your earlier question mm -hmm. about, um, you know, MAS, how we view fintechs. Mm. You know, when we say harness technology, right, mm -hmm. to achieve the four objectives, uh, efficiencies, manage risks, uh, new growth opportunities, make people's lives better, harness technology, um, and for many years, the framing was in terms of harnessing technology. Last year, my revelation right, at the FinTech Festival was about tapping the human spirit. Mm -hmm. right? uh, tapping the human spirit that seeks to make a difference right, through technology. Uh, so it's actually what's on the other side of the technology, which is the human spirit, right. uh, and which is the gathering of fintech players like yourselves, founders, you know, uh, and we see many different types of founders with many different profiles, mm -hmm. people who have left established financial institutions, uh, but leaving on the conviction that 
there is a better way of doing things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so, so we see this, you know, uh, as a community that we are looking to serve, you know, uh, through the FinTech Festival. As you see, you know, uh, for those of you who have been to the Singapore FinTech Festival, it caters, it is not just a big financial sector to big financial mm -hmm. sector thing, right? Uh, it is, uh, brings together people from large economies to developing jurisdictions, mm -hmm. Establish FIs to the small fintechs, um, uh, but also playing a bridging role, right, mm -hmm. between capital, right, uh, investments as well as policy. So from that perspective, right, uh, we look to serve the global fintech community uh, by playing that bridging role, um, and you know uh, we see the fintech community as being a valuable uh, addition uh, to what we currently have mm -hmm. today. Uh, then in terms of your, the, your next question uh, on um, working with other regulators to scale, I think over the years we have worked with the industry and you know, conducted, facilitated many different types of pilots, CBDCs, mm -hmm. asset tokenization, uh, in FX, fixed income, and even fund management. Um, all very promising, uh, but subscale. Hmm. Only amongst a few willing and able, right? Uh, and this is very subscale, right? Now, at some point, right, uh, three things must happen, right? Mm. You need to reach a state where, you know, uh, key players, right, looking to push transformation. Uh, they're looking to push not for their own benefit, not for market leadership and competitiveness reasons, but, you know, you reach a stage where these players look out for other key players, to collectively work together to bring about larger industry transformation. Uh, that's a key thing that needs to happen in order for things to scale, right? Second, you have to move from pilots, limited pilots to scaling uh, industry-wide. Third, you have to scale cross-border, right? Uh, because if you don't meet all these three, right, key players working together collectively uh, achieve broader deep and pervasive industry transformation, right? Uh, if your pilots can't sell, scale industry-wide, your pilots can't sell cross-border, then things are just going to tail off, right? Mm. So, so that's, that's what we need to work towards, right? Promising pilots how to help them scale. So as this happens, I think regulators definitely need to come in, mm -hmm. right? Uh, two things. Um, with this scale of change, what are acceptable standards from a regulatory perspective, from a safety and soundness perspective, from a financial stability perspective? Right? It's one thing when a few players are just doing it yeah. and it's not systemic. But with scale, things can become the systemic. Regulators need to come in. Mm. How to transition to the desired future state, right? Uh, whilst avoiding unintended disruptions, mm. right? your transition towards the desired future state must be smooth. And this is actually a change management issue. It's less about technology at that stage. Mm. I would say to achieve that, regulators need to come up to speed with technology and understand how it's applied. With CBDCs, if that is part of the desired landscape, regulators and central banks are actually part of the change. Mm. right? And lastly, central banks and regulators need to push and steer right, uh, towards common standards and interoperability, right? Because, you know, it's no point harnessing technology, mm -hmm. but the world is fragmented because it can't interoperate. It mm -hmm. defeats the entire purpose, right? So all these things don't happen by chance. Sure. All these things require hard work. All these things require deliberate engagements uh, between regulatory counterparts, right, uh, to make sure that we're all clear, right, uh, on the central bank's regulatory side, mm -hmm. as well as fintechs and the industry, what is the end game we, to, we are moving towards and how to achieve that in a seamless way. Yeah, great. We've only got five minutes left, uh, but I really want to get to this last question and then I'm hoping to open it up to the audience for some quick questions. Um, obviously, we heard uh, the former MD of MAS, Ravi Menon, speak to the audience, uh, to all of us yesterday. Uh, he talked about the need to build a sustainable future and how it's a major priority for fintech 
for good. So which are the ways you think that this goal can be achieved by the global tech community, uh, as well as by regulators enabling fintech for good? So one obvious sort of way is using, you know, using technology, right? I mean, for example, probably, you know, you can do better sort of uh, better lending or you can do, you know, sort of better sort of focusing on on sort of, you know, good sort of lending project and good financial products. Uh, for example, you know, there are many sort of products which is, you know, which is considered unbankable at this point. But, you know, using sort of new technology, those projects may, may become, you know, bankable. So, and which would be uh, good for sustainability. And also, uh, using these new technologies, sort of, uh, the people's uh, people's access to finance would be enhanced quite significantly, right? I think this is also, you know, what uh, you know, Mr. Menon was saying, you know, yesterday. So, uh, I think I think there is a you know huge potential in sort of you know applying sort of new technology into finance, sort of which makes you know sort of which makes finance you know works better for sustainable future. And what we as a regulator can do is. It's not very easy. Um, probably, you know, we shouldn't sort of obstruct sort of this, this kind of movement, and we should we should somehow you know find a way to sort of promote these technologies. And for that, you know, probably uh, what we need we need to sort of hear from sort of uh, the industry and you know those people who are actually doing that. And you know, uh, we need to sort of ask you know what are sort of current uh, if there are any sort of obst obstructions to that, any hurdles for that, and so that you know we can take out those things. Uh, yes, but you know this is here in a very difficult question. So let me share a, a very difficult issue which we are grappling with. Mm -hmm. right? um, when you attend fintech festivals like this, mm -hmm. you see a certain crowd. Yeah. When you attend sustainability conferences, <laughs> you see a very different crowd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had some of them converge yesterday afternoon. We had yes, three yes. sessions of net some zero. Yes. So there's some, you know, uh, overlap between yeah. the two. Yeah. But can I ask how many of you attend COP28? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> Literally only one, right? So, so that's the basic struggle that we have, right? Um, I mean, our starting point, if we all agree, right, we all have a strong conviction that sustainability is existential. We all have a part to play. I think the challenge is, you know, uh, we need to get the fintech crowd to think more sustainability and we need the sustainability crowd to think more fintech, right? Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, many things are involved in getting to net zero, mm -hmm. right? Uh, at the overall economy level, you can have transition strategies, uh, you can have decarbonization strategies sector by sector, right? All these are paramount and important. Uh, but when you get to the heart of it, yeah. Right. Um, I'm simplifying things a bit, uh, but at the core of it is data. Again, <laughs> mm -hmm. so data underpins AI. Data underpins sustainability because to track progress towards net zero, mm, you must be able to measure. Yeah. And to measure, you need people to disclose. Right. Mm -hmm. So can I ask how many of you attended um, the present presentation on greenprint.ai? Mm. Right. Go on, show of hands. <laughs> and not just from folks from Greenprint. <laughs> you know, the motivation behind greenprint.ai yeah. is very simple, right? Uh, you know, when you think about data and disclosure, right, so that you can start to measure, mm. right? Uh, data and disclosure, you don't have to worry about the large corporates because large mm. corporates take care of themselves. You have to worry about the SMEs because mm. SMEs make up 70% of the economy. If SMEs don't disclose, mm -hmm. right, uh, then large corporates can't do, you know, scope three, yeah. Yeah. right? Uh, so, however, if you require SMEs to report, mm -hmm. right, filling in data field by data field, sure. right, and um, uh, on a manual basis, I think the battle is over. It's a non-starter, mm -hmm. right? So if you've, uh, you know, missed the greenprint.ai presentation, please find a way to, you know, watch the YouTube on that. Uh, because the vision is very powerful, yep. right? How do you onboard SMEs, help them do their disclosure? Mm -hmm. Six clicks, 10 minutes. That's it. It must be that simple, mm. right? It must be that simple, right? Then the question is, what starts running? Sure. Right, yeah. with each click that helps SMEs auto-populate, you know, uh, mm -hmm. up to 70% of what they need to disclose, right? 
uh, but it is a very powerful vision. Uh, the MAS team spent the last two years mm -hmm. right, uh, conceptualizing and market testing this, uh, doing market validations. Uh, and today, they're about to launch as a separate company mm -hmm. to build the system. Right? I'm very, very proud of them. Uh, but this is not me making a plug for greenprint.ai yeah. yeah. because I do believe that we need to see many of these kinds of examples mm -hmm. all over the world. Right? Because greenprint.ai models have a key role to play, mm -hmm. right? supporting transition in each and every one of your economies. Sure. Right? And hence, Ravi's strong pitch yeah. for sustainability to part, be part of the fintech agenda. Yeah. That is a wonderful way to end it because we have run out of time. And even though I did promise you all that you get to ask a question, I'm afraid we've we can't because we have run out of time. But uh, hopefully you will be available to answer any of the audience's questions um, uh, if you're around over the next few hours because I'm sure they are bursting with questions. But how wonderful to speak to both of you. Yanasi uh, Sara and Mr. Leong, lovely to see you both and uh, uh, great to um, have you share your insights around uh, regulation and what needs to be done to innovate in this industry. Thank you once again. A big round of applause to both our guests. Thank you, gentlemen.